Hey, it's Kelly. Welcome back to my channel where we talk all about gentle skincare, sometimes self-care, and today we're talking hyped up skincare ingredients. You know, with the popularity of skincare, there's always discussion around the new next thing, right? And there's always these hyped up popular ingredients that you feel like you have to add into your skincare routine or else, right? It's like Pokemon, gotta catch them all. Oftentimes, like the hype and the excitement really don't match up to the actual performance of the ingredients. So it's Today, I want to talk about hyped up skincare ingredients and let you know just again my opinion right this is just what I think but let you know if I think that these are properly rated ingredients are they overhyped are they underhyped are they exactly what they claim to be and I also want to offer you some ingredient alternatives and product suggestions so if you're so ready to talk about hyped up skincare ingredients give the video a big thumbs up and let's jump right in so first up is hyaluronic acid, and I have to say this is totally overrated, and I have been saying this for years. I am talking about those products that claim hyaluronic acid as the star. There's really no other helper ingredients. There's really not many other humectants. They're really just saying, put a lot of hyaluronic acid on your skin and it's gonna be amazing. It's the best humectant out there. This is where I have the problem because I find this ingredient in high quantities as the only you know star ingredient without any other helpers to be really fussy and I hate fussy skincare like I love lots of skincare but I don't like fussy ingredients I don't like to have to think about things too much when I'm layering lots of products and hyaluronic acid is one of those ingredients that gives people so many problems that we've created all these rules around using it which I think is really interesting because you've probably heard it's very common knowledge where you um, you know you have your hyaluronic acid you should be layering that onto damp skin so that it penetrates better into your skin and that will cut down on the stickiness right and um, hyaluronic acid can sometimes make your skin feel dry and tight that's actually dehydration or trans epidermal water loss and so the common advice is well don't forget to seal it in with an occlusive silly right which I find so so interesting because that's just general skincare you know tips <laughs> you should be applying your products on slightly damp skin it en enhances the penetration and everything should be sealed off with some type of occlusive light or thick or whatever some type of fine Final moisturizing product right that's just common knowledge I think it's interesting that we use that as a way to like say oh no 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 you can use hyaluronic acid you're just using it wrong it's like okay um sure but even when you follow those rules I do find it to still be a really tricky ingredient my experience with this and you know hyaluronic acid started getting really popular in KBD way before it got really hyped up in Western skincare so I've been trying this for quite a while you know through KBD products through Western products and every single one has been the same to me it's always sticky it always has this like weird gel like a uh, texture that doesn't feel very hydrating to my skin at all hyaluronic acid just ain't it for me it just does not deeply replenish my skin it does not treat my dehydration and honestly my experience in the past has been that hyaluronic acid actually makes my dehydration worse in the long run hyaluronic acid the ingredient you know it actually is naturally occurring in our body it is that liquidy substance in between our skin cells it kind of helps hold everything together in the skin and so it's naturally occurring it's a goodie um, it is like a natural moisturizing factor the reason why people love it so much and why it's so overhyped is because it's a humectant ingredient that helps to attract and bind water to the skin Here's the problem with topical hyaluronic acid though. Um, when you apply it topically to the skin, it doesn't really do what it does when it's naturally occurring in the body or when you stimulate the creation of hyaluronic acid in the body. Topically applied, the hyaluronic acid molecule is really big. It's super big and that means it's, it's poor at penetrating deeper into the skin um, and kind of getting down into where it needs to go to really plump up the skin to really hydrate it. So this really big molecule sits right at the top uppermost surface of the epidermis and it just sits there and attracts and binds hydration. But because it's so close to the surface of the skin, it also means it can do the reverse. It can actually attract some of the hydration from deeper into your skin, pulling it to the surface. And if you are prone to it, or as the general advice is, if you didn't use your occlusive, right, it's gonna evaporate away. And that's what's causing the transepidermal water loss, that dry and tight feeling in your skin. It's just a tricky ingredient. I just think it's 
applied topically without anything else to the formula. I just think it's a poor, you know, hydrator for the skin. Now there are different versions of hyaluronic acid. So traditional hyaluronic acid is considered high molecular weight hyaluronic acid. But then we have low molecular weight hyaluronic acid varieties like sodium hyaluronic and you see all these other hydrolyzed hyaluronic acid varieties, right? Basically what they do is they take that giant molecule and they chop it up into smaller pieces. So now we have these smaller molecules um, from hyaluronic acid. But the thing is, they're still pretty poor at penetrating the skin. They go deeper than the high molecular weight, but they just still don't go super deep and super meaningfully like, you know, down into the skin. And that's why even those lower molecular weight um, varieties don't always feel super duper hydrating, especially to folks who really need that replenishment. I just think it's actually a poor ingredient to hydrate the skin. But as I mentioned, it can be an amazing addition to hydrating formulas. It can sometimes give you that plump and, and juicy and bouncy feeling to your skin, in my experience, combined with other hydrating ingredients. So I guess my final word here on hyaluronic acid, it's fussy, it's not a great hydrator, right? It's kind of sticky. And I just don't like when like you have to like learn all these rules in order to use a skincare product, right? I just don't like that. So I guess my final word here is if you're looking at hyaluronic acid or you want to get the benefits of it, I would look for it in a more complex formula with other humectants, glycerin, panthenol, other moisturizing factors that can give you a more well-rounded, hydrating, plumping experience. Now let's talk copper peptides. I find this ingredient to be properly rated. I think the hype around this ingredient is real. Um, and I think it might be worth experimenting with it to see if you can't get the benefits that everybody is hyping up about this. Now, copper peptide is seen on the ingredients list as copper tripeptide one. And this is actually a peptide that's been around for a super long time. It's really well studied. It's pretty well understood. And it was discovered in 1973 by Dr. Lauren Pickard. And it actually was first used for its abilities to calm inflammation inflammation and to promote wound healing on the skin. Its first use um, approved by the FDA was for a, a gel, like a hydrating gel that helps with ulcers, um, can help with burns and help just with wound healing on the skin in general. So the collagen stimulating abilities of copper peptide and just it's like skin rejuvenating and renewing um, abilities are really what drive it to the top of the peptide pack when it comes to anti-aging or well aging. Now take this with a grain of salt because the study that I'm about to talk about was done on a very small group of people. And I think we always have to take studies with a grain of salt and not just take them at their word. But this is kind of an interesting study that um, occurred in 1998 and they compared vitamin C, copper peptide, and tretinoin against each other for the collagen stimulating abilities. And what was really surprising in that group is that um, the copper peptide stimulated more collagen um, than vitamin C or tretinoin. The actual results were um, increased collagen production for 70% of people using copper peptides versus only 50% um, for vitamin C and 40% for tretinoin. Interesting, right? Like I said, take it with a grain of salt. But I think what this study proves, maybe not necessarily that one is better than the other, but maybe that copper peptide can kind of run in the same pack as vitamin C and tretinoin, which, you know, are really those gold standard ingredients that are always recommended when you're like, hey, I want collagen stimulation. I want, you know, I want to do the best skincare for anti-aging, vitamin C, retinoids, or retinoids, right? That's what's always recommended. But I think we should start thinking about copper peptides right up there, right alongside of those ingredients too. Now, I'm not saying go out and replace your vitamin C and your tretinoin with copper peptide. That's that's not what I'm saying at all. But actually what I'm saying is keep using those ingredients if you are and you love them and they're working well for you. Think about adding copper peptide to kind of like take your, your routine up a notch. They are so complementary to those other um, ingredients. And you know, there's always like, oh, should you, should you be mixing these? I don't know. There's always that like buzz. Again, we're talking about hyped up stuff, clickbaity stuff, right? Um, you can use copper peptide with retinol. It's fine. It's not really advised to take 
take two strong um, antioxidants like vitamin C and copper peptide and combine them together it can actually cause irritation on the skin. Um, it can cause the, the product to oxidize. So I wouldn't really recommend combining those. But what I'm talking about is like high percentage vitamin C, high percentage copper peptides, like 1% copper peptides. I'm not talking about copper peptides at the bottom of your serum with a bunch of other ingredients in it. Those are probably fine. They're not really going to interact. So it's such a small amount. Copper peptide can be sprinkled into a lot of products and hey, I'll take it where I can get it. But if you want to get serious about this ingredient, like I was saying, higher percentages, these are the ones that I feel are tried and true, at least in my experience. Neod Copper Amino Isolate Serum. This uses 1% of copper peptide. In the Neod Serum, they have combined it with 1% of tripeptide 1, which is also a collagen stimulating peptide. It signals to our body to create more collagen, but it also is a carrier peptide for copper and it helps uh, deliver the copper deeper into the skin where it can you know create more meaningful results so i really like the combination here there's some other peptides in the mix this is a very expensive um, serum that is up in the like the 90 dollar range it's very expensive it works it works. This is one of the very few expensive products where I would say if it fits your budget, go for it. I don't think that you will regret it. It will show you results. It made my skin feel so firm, so fast amazing. But there are some serums out there that don't cost an arm and a leg that you can still get good results from. Another one is from The Ordinary. It's the multi-peptide plus copper peptide serum. So this is in the $30 range. It does a feature 1% of copper peptide, but it doesn't have the 1% of tripeptide in it. It does have another um, peptide mix that kind of helps to support that well aging skin rejuvenating journey. So just because it costs less doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get similar benefits. So that's another option. And then one in between those prices is the Peach and Lily Copper Peptide Pro Firming Serum. I recently started using this and I've been really impressed with the results. Um, there is 0.2% uh, of copper peptide. Again, I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but there is a complex of 13 other um, peptides that really do check out for that well aging journey. And what I've noticed with using this is A, the results happen pretty fast and B, my skin just looks a lot fresher, um, a lot more rejuvenated my pores seem more refined, my skin just seems healthier, um, more, more alive, um, and that's really the magic of, of copper peptide. It's a long-term game as far as, you know, prevention for fine lines and wrinkles or treatment like, can be very hard with fine lines and wrinkles. It takes time, but just seeing that skin rejuvenation is like a really good sign that it's working, right? Next, let's talk Bacuchiel. This ingredient is overrated, overhyped, but solid. <laughs> Let me explain. So I think that it's overrated and overhyped because it is often um, being compared to retinol. Um, I've often heard it uh, referred to as a plant-derived retinol. I've also heard it being called a natural retinol, and I often hear it being referred to as like better than or with retinol-like benefits, but a lot gentler for the skin. And let us be clear here, a Bucuchiol is not derived from vitamin A at all. It is not part of the retinoid family. It is not a natural version of retinol. You know, it's not any of that. It's not related at all. And I think that that is my first like eh, overhyped, right? It's not retinol, so stop calling it that. Second of all, um, it's a great plant extract all on its own. It's actually um, very important in Ayurveda and Indian medicine and traditional Chinese medicine. It is derived from the bab chi plant and it does have a lot of benefits for um, inflammation. It can really help to soothe the skin. It has antioxidant capabilities and antibacterial properties. So more recently, it's been understood that Bacuchiol has some collagen stimulating abilities. And this is where we get that, um, that comparison to retinol. It actually stimulates collagen in a similar way to, as retinol does. And so while well, it's not disingenuous to say, hey, there's retinal like abilities to this, I think that like claiming it as an alternative to retinol is really more where I have the issue. But on its own, Bacuchio can help to stimulate collagen 1, 3, and 4. And it also helps to downregulate the collagen destroying enzyme that can sometimes be found in the skin. So it's protective of the collagen we already have, but it also helps to stimulate some more collagen in the skin. And that's, again, where we get that comparison to retinol. What's interesting about Bacuchio is we really shouldn't necessarily be thinking about it as an alternative to retinol, but actually 
actually a complement to retinol because it actually helps to stabilize retinol formulas. And so you're actually seeing a lot of retinol with Bakuchiol in it because it helps to make a more stable, more, um, more effective, really, right, retinol for the skin. So it can be a nice alternative if you can't tolerate retinol. I would say there's probably better ones out there for collagen stimulation. It's not going to replace retinol. I don't think it's as easy as that. Um, but it can be, like I was saying with copper peptide, it can be complementary to your well aging routine. But to see it as this like, oh, this brand new ingredient, well, it's not brand new. It's been around for a long time, right? That can replace your retinol. Probably not. But it can be a nice addition into your routine. Product suggestions. On the KBD side, Vigano Bakuchiol Antikophoral Serum. I really like this one. It's a really indie KBD brand, but the combination of Bakuchiol and the vitamin E tocopherol, really nice antioxidant serum, right? And Bakuchiol, I found in my personal experience, it was really good for keeping my skin very smooth. It was particularly helpful for texture. I am prone to clogged pores, closed comedones on my skin. And so um, adding in the Bakuchiol just kind of helped keep things clear for me, um, keep things from getting inflamed and turning into pimples. So that was really nice. Um, but just like smooth, bright, healthy looking skin. I'm really unsure of the collagen stimulating benefits. I think it depends on what product you're using in the formulation for sure. And just sticking with something long term. What I'm sticking with is tretinoin. <laughs> but adding Bakuchiol in on my tretinoin off nights was actually really helpful for keeping, like I said, my skin really smooth and clear. Another option that you might consider is Good Molecules Bakuchiol Oil Blend for oily skin. The focus of this one is definitely for acne prone skin, congestion prone skin, skin with texture. Uh, it's a really light oil blend. Um, it's definitely not heavy or greasy. It has been formulated for oily skin. Um, but I think that that can be a nice option to work into your routine. I think, again, the focus here I think is more um, on keeping your skin clear. But then there's also the Polish Choice 0.3% retinol plus 2% of Bakuchiol treatment. As I mentioned, these ingredients actually play super well for formulated together, making a really potent um, and stabilized retinal formula. And that might be the way to go to kind of like take it up a notch with your retinal routine is to find a product with Bakuchiol added into it for some additional benefits because it can help keep your skin clear, can help keep your skin smooth and bright. Then with retinal, which can do a lot of those things plus more, I think it's a match made in heaven. Collagen. This ingredient is so overrated and it is 2023 and marketers are still trying to sell this as the solution to fine lines and wrinkles. Like, come on, please. Collagen does not treat your fine lines and wrinkles. And I know I spent this entire video talking about stimulating collagen to treat your fine lines and wrinkles. But what I'm talking about is collagen as an ingredient that you apply topically to your skin, usually through creams or serums, right? This is what I'm talking about. This ingredient will not treat your fine lines and wrinkles point blank. Collagen applied topically to the skin is amazing humectant. It's great moisturizer. It really conditions your skin. It's, it makes your skin so soft. It feels moisturizing. It helps to attract some hydration into the skin as well. It feels awesome. So I'm not saying avoid this ingredient if you see it on the list because it's a total lie. No, that's not what I'm saying. Like you said, it has a um, really great function in skincare. But if the marketing of that skincare product is like, oh, we have collagen in here, it's going to treat your fine lines and wrinkles. Run, run far, far away because this ingredient just cannot do that. The thing is when we apply collagen, the molecule on top of our skin through skincare, that molecule is too big like hyaluronic acid. It cannot dive deep, deeper into the skin to get to where it needs to go to be meaningfully used to help um, to, to really fortify that collagen structure, that protein structure of the skin. It just can't be used that way. It can't get to where it needs to go. And even, um, you know, there are like the, the chopped up uh, versions, hydrolyzed collagen, that's where they take the molecule and chop it up into smaller. Even that can't dive as deep as it needs to go. And even if it did, our body just doesn't really know what to do with it. It just doesn't recognize it as its own. So that's why collagen as an ingredient applied topically is not going to treat your fine lines and wrinkles. Our body doesn't know what to do with it. It can't get to where it needs to go. 
it's just not really useful. So as I mentioned, it's a great humectant. It's a great moisturizer. It's a goodie on an ingredients list, but if it's being marketed as uh, the ingredient that's gonna treat your fine lines and wrinkles, that is something that we can call out as shady. Like I said, it's 2023, we're all informed now. This should not still be happening. What we really need to be doing is focusing in on the collagen stimulating ingredients, like I said, because when we stimulate our body's natural production, our body knows exactly what to do with that. It knows exactly where to assign it, and it knows how to use it in an effective way to treat fine lines and wrinkles. So these ingredients are, you know, tretinoin, retinoids, retinol, retinol to hide, vitamin C, copper peptides, as we talked about already, maybe even things like bacuchiol, niacinamide at 5% and higher is also a really great one to go towards. There's a lot of uh, cell communicating ingredients that stimulate collagen in the body. That's where we want to put our focus on for fine lines and wrinkles collagen as an ingredient in skincare ain't gonna do it. So I hope you enjoyed this ingredient chat. And if you want me to do another one, let me know what ingredients you want me to debunk or weigh in on. Are you seeing some you know, popular rising ingredients and you're just not sure if they're really worth it? Let me know in the comments. If enough people want it, I will do another video. And I really hope you enjoyed this. If you did and it was helpful, but you haven't hit subscribe, please, I would be so honored if you would take one moment before you go, hit subscribe and turn on notifications. I do release a lot of new skin care content throughout the week. I do full length videos. I do shorts. I also have a skincare podcast where I interview expert guests. So please uh, turn on notifications so you're never out of the loop. I hope you are healthy, happy, and safe wherever you are in the world. And I can't wait to see you in the next video. I love you so much. I'll talk to you soon.